Uh, thank you very much, Tom. And congratulations to Raymond, Tom, uh, and the uh, team at Global Financial Integrity for this wonderful achievement, a celebration of the work of many years and a precursor to the very good work uh, toward curtailing illicit financial flows that is to come. My name is Les Myers. I'm the president of Center of Concern, which is a think tank here in Washington, D.C., uh, that for 45 years has been working through research, education, and advocacy to promote uh, global social justice. I'm also pleased to be a member of the Board of Directors of Global Financial Integrity and to uh, facilitate this discussion uh, with two quite accomplished colleagues in the area. Um, I have uh, immediately to my left John Kassara, who has 26 years of uh, public service working in uh, clandestine service on uh, the intelligence side, but also in law enforcement in a variety of agents, including uh, FinCEN and Treasury, uh, Secret Service, and since leaving government service has been uh, a wonderful thought leader helping to guide the profession, both the public and private sector execution, looking at trade-based money laundering and a variety of forms of illicit financial flows and corruption. And then we have as well Rob uh, Sversky, who uh, spent most of his 25 years in public service working for customs. Uh, and uh, down in uh, Florida, but also in Latin America, and al also focusing on various forms of trade-based uh, illicit financial flows, trade-based money laundering. What we're going to be doing this morning uh, is, or this afternoon, is talking. Uh, we're going to uh, each of them will take about ten minutes to discuss his approach uh, to the issue of uh, trade-based money laundering. We typically think of the three main ways of moving the money around: the financial system, moving the currency itself. Uh, and then, of course, the kind of uh, illicit financial flows, the money laundering that occurs in plain sight through manipulating uh, trade. And uh, so with that, we will have their presentations first, and then we will have a uh, discussion among them and then invite conversation uh, with our guests as well. So uh, please, uh, which, do you know which of you would like to proceed first? Or John, have you? I'll, I'll go okay, first. we'll have John go first then. Thank I, you. I think actually I may stand here. So please. I can see the slides. Absolutely. Yeah. Please. Okay. Sit over here. <coughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It was probably about 2002, not too long after the attacks on 9 11, I had a conversation with a Pakistani businessman who I think we could charitably say was involved with the gray markets. And we were talking about many of the things that. We've talked about already this afternoon and again tomorrow. We were talking about illicit financial flows. We were talking about over and under invoicing. We were talking about countervaluation in underground markets. We were talking about Hawala. And he said something to me that made a profound impression. He said, Mr. John, don't you know that your, your enemies, your adversaries, are transferring money and value right under your noses? but you don't see it. Your enemies are laughing at you. And he kind of hit it, right? But he, it infuriated me because I knew he was right. They're laughing at us. We're talking about multinationals. We're talking about abusive transfer pricing. We're talking about abusive uh, misinvoicing. We're talking about trade diversion. But we're also talking about things like capital flight. We're talking about trade, or excuse me, tax evasion. We're talking about underground financial systems. But what Rob and I want to talk to you about is part of the equation as well that sometimes perhaps gets ignored. But from our perspective, it's extremely important. And that is the illegal part of trade-based money laundering. Not illicit, but illegal. We're talking about things like um, pro proceeds from narcotics trafficking, proceeds from human trafficking, simple customs fraud, all right? These are all illegal. So we're going to take just a few minutes here to kind of introduce the topic for those of you that don't know that much about it, and then I think Rob's going to fall up and give, me, give some of his perspectives on these issues. So as Les started out by saying, the Financial Action Task Force, there's three major ways to launder money. But according to that same financial action task force, if I can do this, yes. That's it? Yes. 
According to that same Financial Action Task Force, they define trade-based money laundering as the process of disguising the proceeds of crime and moving value through the use of trade transactions in an attempt to legitimize their illicit origins. The key word in that definition is value. We often talk, think about money, right? Money as cash, money through a bank, money through an electronic transfer, money through an ATM machine that we transferred around the world, even cyber today. But for some reason or another, it's very difficult for us, particularly in the West, to get our heads around this concept of value transfer. Now, there are all different ways to do this, but it really all involves invoice manipulation. This is a pen. It's a very nice pen. Let's say it's worth $20, okay? It's real cost, manufacturing, insurance, freight, etc. But if a buyer and a seller are working together, the price of this pen can be whatever it wants we want it to be. If I'm working with Rob on the other side of the ocean, through invoice manipulation, we can make this $10 pen or $20 pen appear to be $30 pen or $5. We are over or we were under invoicing. You send enough pens, you sell enough pens, you're transferring a lot of value. I spent a lot of my time in Italy combating Italian-American organized crime, the mafia, by looking at the illicit flows of money going back and forth between Italy and the United States. A very, very common procedure at that time where you had couriers going every day from Rome Malpensa's airport flying into JFK, carrying satchels, bags full of manufactured 18-karat Italian gold jewelry, right? And they would land at JFK, and they would officially declare this stuff and have the supporting documentation that this bag, for example, was $500,000 worth of Italian gold jewelry. But was that really 18-karat Italian gold jewelry? Perhaps it was 22-karat. Perhaps it was 24-karat. Perhaps it was 12-karat Walmart special. Perhaps it was gold-plated lead. Was that really worth 500000 or was it 700000 or was it $50,000? It's the transfer of value via the gold trade. Now, there's lots of different examples, okay, in invoice fraud and manipulation. You can overstate quantity. You can talk around the quality. But it comes down to moving money out and moving money in. I'm not, <laughs> let's put it this way. Sometimes I get challenged by invoice manipulation. So I came up with a cheat sheet, a handy cheat sheet for special agents like myself. If you want to move money out, you import goods at overvalued prices or you export goods at undervalued prices. You want to move money into a country, you import goods at undervalued prices or you export the goods at overvalued prices. Let me give you a couple of really quick examples of how this is done. And again, what we're talking about here is the criminal use of trade. Okay. All right. So here's true examples of abnormal U.S. trade prices. All right. This is all true. I don't have to make anything up. Do you know, for example, that the United States is importing plastic buckets from the Czech Republic at $972 a bucket? That we are importing briefs and panties from Hungary at $739 a dozen? That we are importing iron bolts from France at about $3,000 a kilogram? And toilet tissue from China at $4,000 a kilogram? <laughs> that we are exporting live cattle to Mexico about $20 a cow, that we are exporting bulldozers to Colombia for about $1,700 a bulldozer, and missile launchers to Israel at $52 each. OK, what a deal, all right? Now, remember what I just told you about over and under invoicing? 
you think maybe, just maybe, this stuff needs closer examination? I'm here to tell you, as a former special agent for the U.S. Customs Service, it's not happening. And if it's not happening in the United States, it's not happening elsewhere. Right under our noses. All right. Here is a slide from a real case involving the exports of refrigerators from the United States to a drug producing country in Latin America. All right? So if you look at the purple ups and downs, the peaks in the valley, that represents the sale, the exports of refrigerators from the United States to that other country. The horizontal line represents time. The vertical line represents value. The kind of that lighter blue color is the corresponding data from that other country. If I am exporting 1,000 widgets, and each widget costs, say, $100, when it gets to the other country with some recognized variables, we should still have 1,000 widgets, and each widget should cost $100. But that's not happening here. The peaks in the valleys, the difference between the purple and the blue is the transfer of value in the form of refrigerators. All right? And it only is at the very end when we started comparing our data, US data, with that other country's data, did that basically reach market level. All right? We put them out of business. I'll give you one other quick example. All right, very sensitive. Come on, there you go. Oh. I'm not even touching it there. Very easy, okay. All right, what we're doing here is we are comparing what we call 49 gold, 99.99% pure gullion with scrap gold, all right? This is all gold coming into the United States. And by the way, the United States is a gold-producing country. All this gold is coming into the United States, in this particular example, from countries in Central South America. All right? So let's look at that pretty much solid red line. Again, we're talking about time and value. That solid red line represents, again, supply and demand of 49 gold, pretty Fort Knox type gold bullion, okay? And you can see how it goes up over time. There are a couple outliers there. Statistical anomalies doesn't mean anything, all right? That's 49 gold. And then all those blue dots represent gold scrap. Gold scrap for customs valuation purposes is really not precisely defined. It could be literally anything from the insides of computers to, say, gold teeth taken out to, well, what a customs inspector once told me. He said you could get a 40-foot shipping container, and you could fill it up with metal scraps and shards, stand on top of it, take a salt shaker filled with gold dust, sprinkle it over the top, and then for customs classification purposes, you would then have gold scrap. Okay, everybody with me? So then why are we importing gold scrap at prices higher than gold bullion? Or for that matter, anywhere close to gold bullion? It doesn't make any market or economic sense. But if you're talking about criminal trade-based money laundering, it makes all the sense in the world. Okay? All right, Rob. Thank you, John. That was, uh, that was excellent. And um, having been an 18, GS 1811 special agent and having worked in this field, uh, let me say, John has not exaggerated at all. It's very, very true, all that he said. Uh, Channing, would you, uh, I don't see you, Channing, but you 
she, she's there. Okay, would you flip the slides for me? Okay. <clears throat> okay, the first one's corrosive effects. What I'd like to do in uh, about 10 minutes is just provide you a little bit of a boots on the ground perspective, <coughs> that of a GS-1811 special agent and subsequently as a contractor. And in doing so, I want to focus on the corrosive effects. And um, as Ray Baker and the, the staff here at Global Financial Integrity, who are my heroes, by the way, have very aptly pointed out that the corrosive nature of illicit financial flows are often hidden by the headlines as to volumes. And that certain volume, flows below a certain volume, <coughs> appear to present a lesser challenge. And that troubles me because, you know, one person being shot and killed is, is, also, is just as bad as multiple people being shot and killed. But <clears throat> with respect to the corrosive effects, I just want to touch on a few of, um, of like how it affects your economy and undermining the legitimate economy. And as you see on the slide here, I have certain, that by all means is not inclusive, but certain ways that it does this, it undermines the economy. It also generates crime and corruption, absolutely. One of the big ones and one of the reasons we're here today is the loss of tax revenue, huge. But as I speak about this, I want you to do something for a moment for me. I want you to envision you're out at a land border crossing. Perhaps a, a land border crossing is not very well traveled. And as you're standing there with some of the officials, the border guards, the police, whatever, you see a tractor trailing approaching and this tractor trail is pulling a flatbed. And on the flatbed is a bulldozer, you can see. It doesn't take much to realize this is a very expensive, a very well-manufactured, engineered bulldozer. And it's, been, it's got some mud on it, so it looks like it's been used, so it's not, you don't have a brand new invoice for it. <coughs> but as it pulls up, the law enforcement people, the border guards, customs officials, they scurry about, and one of the, what are they doing? They're looking, as they examine that, they're looking at all the crevices, they're looking for money, they're looking for drugs, perhaps weapons, explosive, things of that nature. And something like this, you're not going to be able to hide people so that's not an issue. So they don't find any of that. And they'll take a glance at the paperwork, yeah, 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 that looks okay, go ahead, they wave it through. Well, what just happened? Well, no, it may not be, may or may not be. However, that bulldozer may in fact be the proceeds of an illicit narcotics transaction. Instead of coming back in suitcases or duffel bags on a uh, small plane to a desolate air airport somewhere, airstrip, or instead of wire transfers, that right there is the value of that cocaine shipment. Or in the case of, say, Afghanistan, I don't know if Heather is in the room today, but in that part of the world, it could be opium. That right there is it, and it's in plain sight. Talk about Heather. And it's, um, <clears throat> it's, you know, it's pretty interesting, and it, it's one of the many ways of transferring value. But now let's take it down, and again, my area of responsibility was Central America, so let me focus on that a little bit. Uh, there was an individual by the name of Waldemar Lorenzana. He was the leader of one of the largest drug trafficking organizations, and Guatemala. Well, he started out as a customs agent, so a little smarter than the average bear, I'd say. <coughs> as he developed his drug empire, included in the different aspects of it, he had front companies to include, as reported, 15 construction companies. So you got 15 construction companies now. <coughs> Are they able to drown out lawful business, lawful construction companies? Oh, yeah. His costs are so much lower. Front companies. Now his companies, hey, they're doing, they're doing construction business, but they're also using that business as part of the integration stage of money laundering, three different stages. He's putting it in. So it's really warping the economy. And talk about policymakers who are trying to look at, at amounts of you know, money, uh, uh, the amounts of flows so they can set policies. How can you do that? You really can't. <coughs> but that's one of the things that, <coughs> in order to get a visual, on how this can be taking place and some of the corrosive effects I just wanted to point out. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> John pointed out and did an excellent examples on, on trade-based money laundering, let's say, for inbound flows into source countries. And trade-based schemes can be used in part in what's called black market peso type operations. In different parts of the world, they use different names. But Latin America, they call it black market peso. But all too often, you know, people hear about that from time to time. In fact, there was a really good article in the New York Times about a week ago about a black market peso operation that was just uncovered and, and arrests were made. But what about the outbound flows, outbound from the developing country? <coughs> the cross-border transfer, the proceeds of corruption, commercial tax evasion, 
done so, and to the credit of global financial integrity of exposing this, in large part by trade mispricing, which is, by and large, is trade fraud. What does this do? It ends up depriving developing countries of a much needed, and actually better described, desperately needed tax base. Next slide, please. Okay, that leads me to an issue which I'll, in a broad sense, I'll refer to as sustainment. But let's start off by talking about training, organizing, and equipping. This is very, very dear to me and important to me. The United States and its partner nations do a marvelous job at training, organizing, and equipping the military services and the security agencies. And, and please keep in mind, when I say security agencies, I'm doing so in the context of your national police, your federal level criminal investigators, your customs officers, prosecutors, and your correction officials, the prison officials of the developing nations. <clears throat> However, following that, it needs to be, it should be, and it needs to be the responsibility of the respective countries to fund these agencies, to fund the yearly budgets. Should it be your ta tax dollars and my tax dollars that funds each and every one of their agencies? I say no. What's needed is an adequate tax base. If they're to do the job that we want them to do here in the United States, that the people want them to do in their respective countries, to, you know, to make, give somebody a fair playing field if they want to be a businessman, <clears throat> the, the members of the security agencies, which I'll say, they need to have salaries that enable the, the recruitment of the best, the brightest, most ethical personnel, and with the emphasis on quality over quantity. Now, a lot of you say, well, this really maybe is not that tough. We don't really need them that bad. I want to remind you all of something called the plata versus plomo. Okay, in Spanish, it's, it's the, the, the lead um, or the bullet, or money or the, or the lead, basically, plomo or the bullet. And what happens in a lot of these countries is that they'll look for young men and women coming out of different universities or working in, in private industry, and they know they're really sharp at manipulating money and trade and things like that, and they come up to them and say, you're now working with us, and we're going to give you a great salary. Well, they may be ethical. They may have, you know, may have a heart and say, no, no, I don't want any part of that. Well, the next thing is, is they're told is that, no, you will work with us, and if you choose not to, you'll die, and most likely your family, and it won't be pleasant, and it's not an idle threat. So, you know, if we're going to action this, they're going to action it. They need, they need the, the best and brightest as well. They need salaries to adequately feed their families, need their workers. Medicine, medical care, afford housing. Here's something very important, and I know it seems insignificant. It's the money, the salaries that enable them to travel safely, securely to and from work. I'll touch on that in just a moment. Okay. They also need protection, and it's not if, it's when they're threatened for doing their jobs and doing them well. And I, I can't stress that enough. Then lastly, and I'll touch on this in a moment as well, the aggressive all-out investigation, apprehension, prosecution, and confinement of those identified as being involved in the threats, the assaults, and the killings. Very, very important. And I won't say which country it is. I'm not trying to demean a country. It applies to a lot of them, actually. I was working with a unit, <clears throat> and this is a very, a unit doing very important work, and I was asking them about their salaries. And what I learned was, I mean, I was amazed, like, how do you live? How do you feed your families? How do you, how do you take care of the basic necessities? And then I was asking, well, how do you, because they notice there's a certain time, they're in a certain time, they're out. How do you get to and from work? And the answer was, oh, uh, taxi or buses. Not the good taxis, the ordinary taxis, the same ones that are compromised by the pandillas, or, or not Spanish, um, the gangs, the criminal gangs. And so what happens? They are very, very dangerous. You know, the embassy tells us, do not ever get in those at all. But they have to use those. And you, know, you think, well, I hope nothing happens to them. Well, it does. And while I was down working in one country, one of the, and I don't want to go into all the details, was assaulted. A woman was insulted, assaulted rather, gun to the head. And it went from bad to worse. And the poor thing was so afraid because you know, that she didn't have the money to live in a better area. So she lived among the very people that did this and knew she would confront them again at some point in time. And very little happened. So how do we expect those kind of people to be motivated to do the job, to stand up when they have to? It's tough. <clears throat> so there's some of the things that, that I think we have to keep in mind. But also, here's another one. They need to have the money to maintain the facilities. Again, training, organizing, equipment. We, we help them build facilities. 
the training facilities and equipment provided by the United States and other donor countries. And just to give you one more example, I could give, stand here all day and give you these, but I'm not, I don't want to do that. I just want to give you a couple. I was working with a certain, and I, I call very elite unit of one country, their federal investigative force, and a money laundering lead had been sent down by a special agent in the United States, and uh, we were covering it. We were out in a rather bad section of that particular city, spent several hours out there gathering our information, and we came back in. The, the fellows were great, and they gave me a desk, and I you know, got out my paper, and I started writing out by hand the report, basically surveillance report and report of investigation, so they didn't have to, and it could be used for both of us. This was what we both saw. And as I'm doing that, <clears throat> The main fellow I was working with, who, I mean, this guy's sharp, the whole unit was good. He came up to me and said, Rob, I'm sorry, but we have to go. And, uh, and I looked at him and I said, sure, sure, no problem. I said, what's up? And he said, we just had, and I can't remember the exact crime, a very horrific crime that just occurred. And he said, it's not just one or two of us, the whole unit, we have to scramble, we have to get on this. And so I said, oh, no problem. So I started packing up my things. And as I'm watching, I'm not seeing what I would see as far as a, an investigative enforcement group in the United States, how they would act, how they would prepare, if they're saddling up to go do battle, so to speak, and, and get on something. So I asked him, I said, well, where did this occur? And he told me, and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, it looks like at least 20 minute, 30 minute drive from here. I said, how are you getting there? And he looks down and he goes, we're either gonna have to take taxis, buses, or hitchhike. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute here. It wasn't that long ago that I know the United States provided Vehicles, good vehicles, enforcement vehicles. So where are they? And he said, come here. We walked to the window, looked down. He said, there they are. He said, they're great vehicles. He said, but we don't have the money to maintain them. They're sitting inoperable in a fence scenario. And my gosh, you know, we provide all this, but shouldn't that the country, should not they have the funding, the funds to, to maintain these vehicles? So next slide, please. <clears throat> One of the things you may be thinking, and I've had this, pointed out to me many times, or said to me, I should say, in, in speaking to different groups, is, oh, they're poor countries. They're unable to afford it. They can't do this. Oh? Hmm. Well, I was in a conference uh, just not too long ago, actually, and it, it, uh, in, the, in the group there were several CEOs of international businesses, many of which do business in Latin America, and one of the speakers <coughs> made the statement and said, wealth is being created in Latin America. People are making a lot of money in Latin America. And his comments were and views were echoed by others. Now, for those of us or those of you in the group that have lived and worked in Latin America in these countries, think back to, to what you saw with a lot of the business owners. And I'm not, I'm not labeling every one of them, but so many of them. Where do they live? They live in palatial type houses and estates, big walls around the, you know, almost like machine gun nests when you look at them. They have their own private security guard force protecting them. They're not relying on the police. Their vehicles are armored vehicles, top of the line armored vehicles. <coughs> They're, um, you know, when they have you know, illness, <coughs> do they go to a local clinic? No, they send them to the United States for the best hospital there. It's a, it's a whole different thing. So you, you have to look at that and say, wait a minute, there is money there. There is people making money. So <coughs> next, um, next thing. So now let's, let's talk about now and, and just kind of refocus our, our attention for a moment on on corruption and commercial tax evasion, which again, GFI, my hat's off to all of you for pointing all this out. But let's talk about an ongoing matter that's going on right now in Guatemala. I would say because of the makeup of this crowd, most of you are probably very familiar with this. If not, there's a massive customs fraud network that has been exposed in, the, in Guatemala called La Línea, or The Line. <coughs> Uh, to, to bribes, alleged to have taken bribes to reduce customs duties, making millions off the foregone government revenue. And <clears throat> one of the things here, and as I point out on the slide there, the winnowing tax base, this is very important. La Línea Networks, and this is from foreignpolicy.com, was pocketing $260,000 a week while the country's schools, hospitals, and police stations languished. Pretty bad when something's happening and you're calling desperately for the police and they're not coming or you, don't, you can't get your child to a hospital, or they don't have the, the, the medicine, or your, your child is, is not getting an education, you know it much worse, they're being bullied and nothing can be done. <coughs> and that's just one example. I think back to one of the cases I was involved in during my, my assignment to a, one of the embassies in a customs attache office, it was the Aleman Jerez investigation in Nicaragua. The amount of money stolen, 
It was incredible. And then I'd be up in the mountains of Hinotega, Matigalpa, and different other areas, poor areas around Manawa. And you see people living in huts that are made of mud, basically. Hmm. And so much money was leaving the country. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And then we go to commercial tax evasion. Now, this is from HondurasWeekly.com, and it pertains to 2011, but by no means, in my opinion, has it really changed that much. But it was revealed by Honduran government officials that 34 major companies in Honduras reported total sale revenues of, in U.S. dollars, roughly $945 million, but paid no taxes. Okay, the uh, Honduran government lost, it was estimated, approximately in U.S. dollars, $13 million because of these firms. And one of the statements was, was me, we have to put a stop to this bleeding. So again, I ask you, is the money there? Are the security agencies now that I was just mentioned, are they adequately funded? Next slide, please. Well, this is something that's very, very tragic. December 2009, General... Julian Gonzalez, who at that time he was retired Army General. At that time he was the anti-drug czar of, um, of, Nicaragua, I mean of Honduras. He was within, I think it was two months of retirement. He was aggressively going after the cartels. He was aggressively going after the clandestine airfields where these planes were coming in with the shipments. And because he didn't play ball with them and because he didn't back off, he dropped his, I think it was two daughters off at the school and as he was pulling away, two men on a motorcycle come up, back, got in the back of a submachine gun, brrrp, 10 minutes, or 10 bullets, he was killed, killed on the street. April 2013, Prosecutor Orlan Chavez, I talked to some of the folks that worked with him, they said he was excellent, very good man. Chief of their anti-money laundering division, asset forfeiture of the organized crime division of their attorney general's office, shot dead on the night in Tuyusigalpa in his pickup truck, the same type, two men on a motorcycle. What he would do at night, he'd, one of the nights a week I understood here, I was told he taught at a local law school. <clears throat> he came out, again, they just done an, or completed an enforcement action, and that was the payback right there, and sends the message, don't even think about doing this. <clears throat> and as I have in the little banner, whoops, the banner at the bottom, if you go back, it's those, it's reported that those responsible for both of those killings have yet to be identified, apprehended, and prosecuted, okay? Last slide is, <clears throat> it's important to remember <clears throat> that the amount of, or a high percentage of the illicit financial flows are conducted through trade mispricing, again, trade fraud. And with that, one of the things I'd like to do, I'd like to just mention in one of the bullets of the nine bulleted recommendations by GFI, that being, and I concur with them, on boosting the customs enforcement ability of the respective countries' customs services. Well, now, keep in mind, many of those customs services don't have criminal investigative divisions. And so, first off, what I would recommend is, yes, you want to boost them by creating such units, preferably standalone, because let's face it, the, the, the people in charge of the customs units are generally appointed by the incoming president and their own people, and of course, they want them to do what they're going to do. So, preferably standalone, but if not, within the customs service. Staff, very, very importantly, by quality criminal investigators, again, quality over quantity, and provide them with the tools, or certain tools that they need to be provided with in order to action this. <clears throat> what I would say, and just in closing, my thanks to GFI on bringing this threat to light, to our attention. And I would like to see the United States action this threat to the extent we can, perhaps in this proposed $1 billion um, aid package that, that if it ever gets approved and goes, maybe dedicate some of this money to, to creating offices of investigation and training, organizing, and equipping, giving them a running start. And also, I'd like to point out that there are many brave men and women. I worked with a lot of them, risking their lives on a daily basis. And they need, they need a fighting chance to, to survive to, in dealing with these transnational criminal organizations. When I say that, both the, the gangs, the ruthless gangs, and the cartels. And in doing so, decrease the levers, levels of desperation that leads to the mass child migrations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John and Rob. And I was thinking something very similar to your closing comments. The, the thing that really becomes very vivid to me is the courage that you and your colleagues have spent. Um, in so many instances, things we'll never know that you and your colleagues have been doing uh, 
uh, both in the United States but especially abroad, uh, to try to confront uh, these types of behaviors directly. And there's a certain uh, vicious, there's a real vicious circle here. I mean, you've already had in indications of it uh, in the comments today. Uh, there doesn't seem to be enough money for the infrastructure uh, for the rule of law all the way through enforcement, vigilance, uh, uh, prosecution, et cetera. Uh, and it just feeds on itself in, in terms of that corrosive effect uh, and gets uh, worse and worse. So these are clearly issues of social justice. When I think about the work of GFI over these years, and one of the reasons I've been so proud of GFI, I look at the leadership of Raymond and the work of, of uh, Dev and now Matt and, and Joe, taking data and making very good use of data and turning data into meaning. And when I think about the testimony of stories like this, and I've heard so many before from my years at KPMG and working in the forensic practice alongside um, intelligence, uh, military special forces, and uh, law enforcement agents. Those are two sources of data to help us inform our consciences, to form and inform our consciences. And the key task now is to figure out the moral narrative. And I think Thomas has helped us do that very adroitly in, in his excellent presentation as well. It, helped, it causes us to have to rethink a lot of the ways we approach development about the drug trade. It's not just don't say no, but we need to think seriously about the demand aspect here in our relationship with other, other nations. So there are a lot of things going on here. Um, and as we enter the conversation, let's be mindful as well that we're going to have a visitor in our city tomorrow who has been talking about precisely the interrelatedness of, of all of these issues as matters of social justice and someone from uh, the Western Hemisphere, a Latin American uh, pope. Um, it seems, uh, as we think about it, I also teach business school at Georgetown, and I always, when I hear these stories like the ones you guys are telling, um, I keep thinking if, they, if these criminals would use 10% of this effort to be honest, uh, you know, without having to go through all these contortions, you'd think that they would be making uh, a fair amount of money uh, anyway. There's a certain sense economists talk about transaction costs, and one would think that it takes so much effort to try to structure the, this trade-based money laundering that it, it sim so simply wouldn't be worth the effort. And maybe at the level of the particular value of the things that they're, they're moving back and forth, that's not the issue. I guess what I was struck with, John, and perhaps you could comment on this, um, at the beginning, you were giving all of those examples of just outrageous pricing. It was like the stories we've heard over the years with Pentagon, uh, you know, procurement, et cetera. And you said these are actual things that are happening. What is going on on this side of the border if we are the best trained, best equipped in terms of customs, in terms of our priorities in the political process? Because these are things we can control in terms of where Congress is spending its money in terms of funding. Uh, so perhaps you could comment on the decisions in the political process here in terms of enforcement. Well, I think your point is well taken. And oftentimes when I go overseas and I'll give a you know, a much lengthier presentation, go into a lot of detail about what the United States is able to do and what we're not able to do. First of all, I want to say the United States, in my opinion, we probably have the best customs service in the world. I think we have the most robust law enforcement in the world. We certainly have the more most resources to pour at this problem than any other country if we had the political will to do so. But all these things that we put up there and more, this is what's going on in the United States. We have all those benefits. But when I go out and talk to the developing world, they don't have those advantages. And if this is going on in the United States, what do you think is happening in, those, in the developing world? This many, many times more. So I think what we have to do is kind of the things Rob was talking about, to reorder our priorities a little bit, support them when we can. But there's also a... Um, Lack of capacity issue, mm -hmm. lack of awareness. Um, we have to start taking these first steps. And the other thing I would just like to add very quickly is we're very fortunate, and I think, again, GFI has paved the way in a lot of this, but we have more data than ever before. We have more analytics than ever before. We are on the verge of being able to have more transparency in international trade than ever before. Mm -hmm. So we have to get to that next level. And, um, and thank, thank you, John. And Rob, uh, there's, a sense, you know, there's that expression in politics, where's the outrage? Uh, and we think about our own country, and it must be heartbreaking, the kinds of things that you're, you're describing, you're seeing overseas. 
And you're appearing at an event like this, and what more can we do as we think about the resources of GFI and the network here in this room to get these kinds of stories out and so that people ask their own members of Congress, it doesn't sound very exotic or you know, dramatic, but we need more money for customs interdiction for things like this. We shouldn't be focusing on you know, immigration and you know, not that that's unimportant, but this is a very serious issue and how can we begin to motivate the issue and what might be things we could do internally with our political process? Oh, that's a very good question. Let me, um, <laughs> let me just say this and it compliments what John was just saying. Uh, those of us who worked customs fraud type cases during our careers, and let me preface it by saying a lot of times you had to just about drag agents into that group, kicking and screaming, because most agents are type A personality types. They want to be doing the, the real exciting stuff, kicking indoors, working heroin, weapon smuggling cases, and work a fraud case. Oh my gosh. You know, I was one of the anomalies I asked to go. And, um, <clears throat> and so you have those kind of people, and you don't have, or very, you don't have enough of those. But the other part of it is, is the amount of funding that's, that's dedicated to the Customs Service for this. And um, not too long ago, I had a conversation with an individual businessman who had met with several other CEOs of major companies, and they made the statement, and they were talking about something very similar, and they made the statement that, well, why isn't more being done? And the answer that came out was, because people, the businesses don't want it being done. And we used to hear businessmen joke from time to time, and, and John, I'm sure, was around a lot of times when they didn't know who we were. And they were joking around us, especially the import-export community, and they would basically be saying, oh, yeah, customs fraud is a national pastime in this industry. And um, you know, sadly, for, you know, there's many good ones and honest ones, but for a lot of them it is. They're going to they're gonna cheat whenever they can. That's why you have to have an enforcement arm, and you have to staff them with really aggressive agents that approach it like a drug case and a gun case, not just like an ordinary fraud case, and give them the tools. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Joe, is it possible to get at least one question from the audience? Is that okay? Okay, because I, I do want to, we, we don't have a particularly long session, but we have two simply wonderful uh, presenters here. If I could get, if you could briefly identify yourself and your affiliation and just uh, ask, uh, put it in the form of a question, yeah, sir. Hi, I'm James North, I'm a writer, and my question is... Here, here comes the microphone. Oh, sorry. Hi, uh, my question is, uh, thanks to all of you for a terrific presentation. The latest developments in Guatemala sound quite promising, particularly with the UN involvement and the independent agency. Um, I was astonished that, I know a little bit about Guatemala too, I was astonished at the results there. I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit about that. And just okay. thank, thank okay. you very well, much, sir. Just okay, well, keep in mind now, who, who conducted this investigation? It was that UN organization. Was it the Guatemalan Customs Service? Um, I think not. The, um, the director of Guatemalan Customs, I found the report I read the other day, is accurate, was just arrested as uh, being a conspirator in that, in that La Lina. Okay, and so um, again, the, uh, the 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 custom services in a lot of these countries are really, and John, you know, it, um, please chime in. What you find is they're I'm not saying it's a derogatory manner, but a little more than revenue collection agencies, mm -hmm. and really not very good at that, mm -hmm. even at that. And it's done, in my opinion, by design. Mm -hmm. There's so much money being made by businessmen, especially those that want to get money out, you know, illicit financial flows out. They don't want anything changed. And so there has to be a revamping, and I would love to see that revamping take place in all the countries. And, uh, and believe me, I've worked with some people who I have the utmost admiration for in these countries. They are honest, honest, deep into the heart, honest, and they're literally risking their lives every day. And when we find those, we really need to support them. Okay, thank you. And John? I would just like to echo what, what Rob said. The U.S. Customs uh, Service, now um, ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, uh, Homeland Security investigations, different than most custom services around the world. Most custom services around the world are involved with old-fashioned inspection and control. That's all they want. They want to, you know, collect the taxes and the tariffs, duties, all this type of stuff. If they see something like we just discussed, A, they probably don't recognize it for what it is, and B, they don't investigate. And if they possibly do investigate, they pass it off to a country's financial police of some sort. They generally don't have the expertise. They generally don't have the, the will to do it. So these things don't get worked. So it's a vicious cycle. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Is that, can we do one more or are we? Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Christy. Yes, sir, please. And if you could identify yourself. Sure, my name's Henry Bellani. John, uh, uh, 
Thanks for your uh, presentation. Great, by the way. One, uh, I think one of the things that we need to think about when we look at TBML is one of the principal actors that haven't been actually mentioned during our discussion, and that's banks. Mm -hmm. right? Banks are essentially, when you follow the money and you look at where the uh, flows go in and out and so forth. It's, it's really tying TBML to AML mm -hmm. in terms of rules and regulations and so forth. We hear a lot about uh, these uh, various uh, banks getting fined for AML transgressions and violations and so on. What, in your opinion, and from, from uh, your perspective, is how should banks play, uh, what, what role should banks play in the, in the eradication of TBML? Um, basically, it goes down to know your customer. Know your customer and your customer's customer, okay? And be aggressive in recognizing trade-based money laundering in all its guises, okay? Traditional trade-based money laundering, what we were talking about, and its links to underground financial systems, such as the Chinese uh, underground flying money systems or Hawala or whatever it is. Um, banks get involved a lot with trade financing, for example. Okay, They see data. If they see something that is suspicious, file suspicious activity report. I am heartened because trade-based money laundering is getting increasing attention um, not only by banks, but money service businesses. They recognize it for what it is. There has been some thought within the Financial Action Task Force that sets the guidelines for um, uh, anti-money laundering, counterterrorism finance programs and policies around the world. The, some indication that they are focusing more and more now on trade-based money laundering issues. And something I do want to mention, I'm putting a plug in, I just wrote a book called Trade-Based Money Laundering, The Next Frontier in International Money Laundering Enforcement. I wrote it for bank compliance officers. It's due out in November. Um, go ahead, Rob. If I had one point to this, one of the things, reasons that trade-based money laundering is not just um, sustaining, but it's flourishing, is that it's so difficult to detect. I mean, once you detect it, it's difficult to investigate it. And then once you get it investigated, it's sometimes it's very difficult even to get it before a federal prosecutor. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 their eyes get glassy because it's so complicated a lot of times. So with that, if you keep that in mind, let's go back, take a step back to the banks. Okay? <clears throat> well, uh, I'm sad to say that even though there's been great strides, there's a lot of banks that really don't want their compliance officers finding things. Right. And if you go and survey a lot of the anti-money laundering investigators, you could call them or whatever, ask them how many on their staff are former customs inspectors. You know, how, many, how many have the experience that understand import-export, that understand documents, that understand valuation, understand the type of things, the little minute, the, the things that, that the bad guys exploit and exploit well. And I bet you're going to find very few, if any. And One, so we need those kind of people. And thank you, Rob. One of the things I noticed many years ago is uh, if you put a bunch of uh, uh, AML BSA officers from global banks in a room together, they very quickly will identify and interact, uh, identify with each other much more than with their own institutions. There's a there's a sort of culture within mm -hmm. uh, within the institution there. One other. Uh, bright spot possibly that just happened about 10 days ago. We, we've noticed a number of high-level prosecutions of banks over the last several years, uh, including over AML-related uh, issues. And yet, we've, many of us have been very disappointed not to see individuals prosecuted. Uh, Sally Yates, the Deputy Attorney General, just issued what I guess will now be called the Yates Memo, uh, going back all the way to the Thompson Memo around 2003. But uh, just about every Deputy Attorney General will at some stage issue a memo with instructions to the U.S. attorneys in the field. And this one, uh, it made, made news because uh, 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 Attorney General Lynch has been very, very strident about going after individuals. And if banks, or any companies, but including banks, want to get credit for cooperating with the government in terms of an investigation, they need to name names. And it, the, this wall of secrecy, the moral hazard, et cetera, uh, needs to end. So at least that's the most recent. That's about 10 days old uh, in terms of this guidance to the U.S. attorneys in the field. Um, we do need to conclude the session. A couple of years ago, uh, Pope Francis talked about the problem of the globalization of indifference, the fact that people around the world simply don't care about these issues. They either don't know about them or they, if they do, they don't care. And these affect everything about the quality of life, the sense of the common good, about income inequality, the ability to live in a civil and stable society. 
Um, and what he has exhorted us to this year with the most recent encyclical is to move to a globalization of hope, which means really doing the kinds of things that gl global financial integrity is doing through this research and will continue to do, and to continue to engage with uh, folks like Rob and John and other specialists in the field. So I hope that we will take this opportunity this week to be talking very seriously and openly about all of these issues of global justice. It's not just about the economy, or and it's not just about ecology and rent extractions. All of this is related, and all of it has to do with justice. And I'll just conclude that uh, with regard to the comment that we see in three of the Gospels, that there will always be poor among us, uh, what Jesus was commenting on was not their material state of poverty, uh, but their openness to God. Uh, and uh, so that we don't make that a crutch or people have over the centuries. And so even in a secular sense, what that calls upon us is a responsibility uh, to pay attention to the least well-off around the world uh, and to make the quality of their lives uh, really the standard, uh, the things that we're able to do and we're not doing, the very things that my colleague, my brother philosopher, uh, Thomas was talking about. So I want to uh, thank our panelists for uh, their service to our nation. Uh, I want to thank them for their continuing work. I want to thank them for being here and thank you for your conversation. And I'm hoping they'll be around later uh, in the uh, reception to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I want to echo uh, Les's thanks to John and Rob. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel. We're going to take a very quick uh, coffee break. We're going to reconvene at 2.15. Thanks.